Literary hoaxes and tall tales present fantasy under the appearance of fact with the intention of exposing reality itself as a literary effect. Hoaxes, tall tales, and the like have played a large part in American folklore and American humor. Benjamin Franklin, originator of so much else in American civilization, submitted what might have been the first literary spoof to a London newspaper on May 20, 1765, as a satirical reply to some of the statements about American colonists circulating there. His letter called particular attention to the origins for those statements in Europeans' collective wish to believe in a fabulous rather than an actual America. So he mentioned a story he claimed had appeared in all the British papers last week that the people of Canada were preparing to set up a cod and whale fishery this summer in the Upper Lakes. Franklin noted that the grand leap of a whale in that chase up the fall of Niagara was esteemed by all who had seen it as one of the finest spectacles in nature. Franklin's hoax reveals the source of the tall tale itself as a wish to trick a listener into belief in a deception. When the gull for the tale is a stranger, his credibility structures the difference between the members of the community who are in on the game and an outsider whose entry into the community coincides with being taken in by the tale. That's how he got the better of his British associates. The American tall tale made its formal literary debut in Washington Irving's History of New York by Diedrich Knickerbocker, which included a notorious profile of one Governor Wouter Van Twiller, who was exactly five feet six inches in height and six feet five inches in circumference. But the tall tale would not have become a flourishing literary enterprise were it not for the Western frontier. Readers were eager to believe anything reported to have taken place in that borderland seemingly devoid of history. The backwoodsmen represented by such historic figures as Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett would repeat endless wild tales of exploits whose exaggerations and hyperboles indulge readers seemingly insatiable need to make believe they believed. But it took Mark Twain to turn hoaxes and tall tales into a consummate art form. He had a great fondness for gulling the entirety of the public as was evident in the Grand Jumping Frog of Calaveras County. Now, one of Twain's most solemn and perhaps most successful hoaxes appeared in a paragraph from the Double-Barreled Detective Story, in which, among other details, the narrator explains how far in the empty sky a solitary esophagus slept upon motionless wing. Modi C. Broatwright, discussing the art of tall lying, has argued that the settlers who moved west with the frontier had in the tall tale developed one of America's few indigenous art forms. James Melville Cox has described the memorable examples of tall talking that Mark Twain added to Adventures of Huckleberry Finn as Huck's conversion of humiliation, failure, anger into a tall tale which will both move and rouse the listener, move him to laughter and rouse him to skepticism. Walt Whitman converted the cadences of tall talking into one of the most uplifting passages in Song of Myself. I am an acme of things accomplished and I am an encloser of things to be. 
my feet strike an apex of the apices of the stars. On every step, bunches of things, and larger bunches between the steps. All below duly traveled, and still I mount and mount, rise after rise, bow the phantoms behind me. And down, I see the huge first nothing, the vapor from the nostrils of death. I know I was there. I waited unseen and always, and slept while God carried me through the lethargic mist and took my time and took no hurt from the fetid carbon. In Whitman's Song of Myself and Melville's Moby Dick, the tall tale now communicates a language in pursuit of nature's hiddenmost secrets and reveals life itself to be the celebration of play for immortal stakes this world exists to realize.